Kirkoto. I'm going to talk today about um, understanding, forecasting, and planning for broad scale predator control for kiwi recovery. Uh, and this is all sort of built out of uh, or built upon two big programs in, the, in DOC. One is uh, that does broad scale control of predators. One is uh, save the Save Our Iconic Kiwi program, which aims to achieve a 2% increase in kiwi populations per annum across New Zealand and across taxa. So some taxa are already doing very well, where others are not doing so well. And then Battle for Our Birds, which aims to protect vulnerable bird species by doing very broad scale um, 1080 operations, up to 800,000 hectares. So the, the basic processes involved with this are that um, forest productivity, which may be punctuated by massed seeding events, which will lead to increased rodent populations. Stoats then feed on rodents and do very well, and their populations increase. And that puts the birds, in this case kiwi, at risk. Kiwi are vulnerable, ki kiwi chicks are vulnerable to to predation up until they're about a, a kilo in weight. Now this process can be interrupted by management or control. In this case, aerial 1080 drops. Uh, the rodents eat the 1080 baits and die. And they have, uh, 1080 has an, two, two influences on stoats, or two, two directions that it, it influences. One the reduction in stoat population reduces, or sorry, the re reduction in the rodent population reduces the, the stoat population. And stoats also eat rodents that have consumed 1080 and die. Note that I don't have an arrow that goes from 1080 directly to stoats because stoats don't eat the bait. So to get at stoats, we need to use rodents as a vector. So but subsequently, stoat populations decrease. That decreases the predation rate on kiwi, and kiwi populations can grow. So that's, that's what's going on here. And most management decisions that, are, that decide when and where to deploy 1080 are made by a, a, a group of people, very knowledgeable and experienced people, sitting around a room, talking about these dynamics and bringing their expertise to the table and making decisions in a, in a somewhat ad hoc way. So while this seems relatively simple, it's actually quite complex, and there's actually a lot we don't know about these processes. So the aim of this, our work, is to um, try to pull together the best of what we know about these processes and put it into a spatially explicit context which allows movements, dispersal, and these uh, processes to find out what different strategies, what sort of outcomes for Kiwi will, will, we can expect um, given different management strategies. And I, I'm using the uh, uh, Save, our Ikini, uh, Save Our Iconic Kiwi program in, in, um, in Fjordland as a template for this presentation and, and developing this model. And here we're, we're, I'm going to talk about four different management zones. You can see them in colored areas here. Freeman Burn, Mount Forbes, uh, Wet Jacket, and uh, West Cape here. And so we're running our model over the entirety of, entirety of Fjordland. And we run it out for 20 years. And we, we <coughs> assess how management in these, or how Kiwi outcomes uh, occur within these management zones and then across all of Fjordland. Because remember, we're trying to achieve a 2% increase across all of New Zealand, not just small management zones. So how do we do? So the question is, how much will a Kiwi population grow or decrease given a predator management strategy over a 20-year period? Um, and so one of the, the management strategies is a pres pre prescriptive roll out of 1080 over time. So it, uh, um, 1080 operations are rotated every four years or three years across these four management zones. Or a reactive 
response to uh, um, rodent populations. So we may put out tracking tunnels, and if we get 20% tracking rat tracking tunnel rate in a management zone, then that would trigger a 1080 response. Or if 50% of the the zone was in mast and produced going to produce or producing high seed. Um, high amounts of seed, then that might trigger, or that would trigger a 1080 response. And so what I'm gonna do now is just walk you through the, the, the outcome of the, the model and show you spatially what it, what it looks like. And so up in this upper ramp, and it's, again, it's over the entirety of Fjordland, and in this uh, upper left-hand panel is masting. So in this year, there's no masting occurring. And then in the middle upper panel is where control is applied. So here you can see that it's done in the Mount Forbes and the wet jacket management areas. And then here are rats. And um, sort of red is a lot of rats, and yellow is moderate, and green is not very many rats. And then stoats <coughs> are down here. And then finally, kiwi are over here. So that's, I'll just walk through a, a few, few years of this. These are all years in sequence. So in the next year, there happens to be a big masting event, as you can see up here. And then we get, we get uh, control operations in Mount Forbes, Wet Jacket, and West Cape. You can see the rat response to the masting events. Rats are low where we, we did control. They're very high where there was masting, and they're, they're moderately high elsewhere. Stoats, in response, are low where we have been doing control. They're high where uh, the masting occurred and rodent numbers got out of control. And then, well, kiwi change, very, they cha their populations change very slowly, so you don't see a, a big change from the previous year. So then uh, 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 in the, the next year, after the mast, you can see the rodent population dies back, it crashes due to overcompetition and a lack of resources. But the stoat population remains relatively high. You can see these big red areas, orange, red colors of, of stoats. And then, uh, yeah, this is my last one for this little um, sequence. Um, and just look briefly at the, the general distribution of kiwi across this landscape. There's this is this higher area of kiwi sort of corresponds to the higher elevation areas, which appear to act as a bit of a refuge for kiwi. Whereas they don't, they're not doing very well right down along the coastline, where it's a very high, high productive beach forest, where there'd be a lot of food productivity for rats. There'd be a lot of rats in those areas, and there hasn't been a lot of control, or not no control. So. Let's look, look at the results in a slightly different way. We have three panels here. The top one is uh, rat density over time, and then stoats and kiwis. And this dashed line, and, then, and we have time, or years on, the, on this x-axis here. This dashed line is today. So what I did is I went back 50 years, so back to 1968, and, and I seeded the, the population or the, the area with uh, this happens to be the Mount Forbes area, so this area here, with about two kiwis per square kilometer, and then let the model run out with no control. So this is pre-control of this, this area, and the stoats and rats came to a sort of equilibrium with each other, and kiwi declined. And then we get to today, where control starts, the rats and stoats populations drop down, and then sort of level off at an equilibrium with ongoing control. And the kiwi increase very, very slightly. Very slightly, but they're not decreasing, at least in, in, in this scenario. Now, this increase in kiwi here uh, is, not, is, is below the, the target threshold of 2% per annum set by DOC. Uh, if you had a 2% per annum per year, it would approach more this, this red line. So you would see a very slow increase. So it's increasing, but not as fast as we would like. 
And then this, this, these three panels show the, the, species, the, the rats, stoats, and kiwis for the entirety of Fiordland. So that's what the sort of all means up here, all. Uh, and kiwi decrease over the entire period up to today, and then they continue to decrease for the next 20 years into the future, despite the, the, um, the uh, control that's going on, or that I've, that I've modeled in this, in this um, scenario. Now I have to put in a little caveat here that um, there are battle for our birds operations going on in here as well, so this might not be as dire as it first appears, but I suspect that it will still be negative once we put those in. I mean, this big, big area here is the Wapiti area, so nothing's going to happen in there. So big tracts of Fjordland are not, not um, open to management. So look at it one more way. Uh, if we look at our reactive strategy, so again, responding to either mass or rodent tracking tunnel rates, uh, the the proportional change in the kiwi population over the management zones increased slightly, again decreased over all of Fjordland. So there is an increase, but again this, uh, this is a, a proportional change over 20 years, not per annum. If we had a per annum um, increase of, point, or, uh, of 20 percent, these numbers would be closer to 0.5. So it's well below what we're actually hoping for. Okay, so the pres prescriptive strategy, so we do uh, a 1080 operation every four years, so there's three years without any, any control going on, is not, not looking very good. We have decreases in the Kiwi population or just hovering at zero. And again, um, uh, so the number of 1080 operations for the reactive protocol was 29 or 30 um, 1080 operations per the 20 years. With the prescriptive four year, we have 20 operations over 20 years. So it's a lot less effort with the consequent result. And then the prescriptive three year strategy, so we go every three years, each management zone would have a 1080 operation. It's uh, comparable to the reactive response. We get a slight, slight increase in the Kiwi population. And the number of operations for, again, the reactive is about 30, and the number of operations for the prescriptive is about 26. So l l fewer operations for the prescriptive. However, to do the reactive strategy, we have to do a lot of field work. We have to do a lot of monitoring. We have to assess masking. So there's a lot of effort goes in, into that as well. So this, the, the hidden costs in, in um, this program is, is um, quite a bit higher than would be in this one, the, the three-year prescriptive program. So in summary, we've put together we tried to assemble the best of our knowledge of um, these dynamics, put it in a spatially explicit model that allows us to challenge our thinking about um, what, how we approach these problems. What we think when, we, we, when managers get together and decide on a program and assume that they're going to get a 2% growth, well, maybe that's not going to happen. Um, so. Hopefully this is going to help identify our, our knowledge gaps, where new research needs to focus so that we can improve our predictive ability and, and uh, come up with, with um, cost-effective plans for broad-scale control. And then uh, the, the results here of this little analysis show that the reactive strategy gives marginally better Kiwi outcomes than the three-year pre prescriptive strategy. It requires 30 operations over the 20-year period versus 26 operations for the prescriptive period. But again, it requires intensive monitoring, which isn't a bad thing, but it costs money. Um, the four-year prescriptive program fails, really. More than two years without a 1080 operation may result in declining, declining Kiwi populations. 
And then our, the, the goal of um, Save Our Iconic Kiwi of uh, achieving a 2% growth per annum in Fiordland or even in these, managed, these intensively managed areas might be unrealistic. Um, that's not necessarily a bad thing. That, that it appears as if we can achieve a positive population growth, but it's maybe not as high as we had, we had hoped. And until we can, we can um, come up with better techniques for controlling predators over large scales, we need a, a means to, to hold the line, and well, this, this, might, this might do it. So I have a, a list of contributors. I'm looking for more input into this, so always glad to, to grow this list. Um, and then acknowledgments to MB for funding the, the program. Thank you.